For a house to become a home, more than an architectural form is needed. Hence the linkage of house and household, and especially the need of a house to become a social unit. And I quote, the locus of heterosexual reproduction and socialization, but also a stage for ordering social and economic relations, as Friedman calls it. In this sense, the house as a home is also a nexus of social and economic activities, and hence achieves a political importance, since the productive and consumption role occupies a major role in the amalgamated whole, which is the community. You could almost say he who rules the home, or she who rules the home, rules the community. The house is the society. And throughout the different periods of Minoan civilization, houses are given great prominence, and many of them are striking architectural creations, surprising because of their size, design, elaboration, and decoration. Clear signs, in my opinion, for the role played in inter interpersonal relationships. They are unmistakably more than physical residences. They are also transcend transcendent categories with a life of their own. Houses stand for social groups and are symbolic, symbolical fo foci. Hence the title of my paper, which makes a deliberate reference to the house of the father as fact and symbol, Patrimonialism and Ugarit and the Ancient Near East by David Schloon, published in 2001, a book which one of the conveners of the present workshop, and I don't mean Quentin, used for his 2007 Tallahassee paper, proposing to see my own society as a scaling up of basic social units. To be fair, Schloon's use of the term house of the father comes from Max Weber's patriarchal household, whereas he himself preferred the term patrimonial. Much of Schloon's discussion was based on a textual analysis on the composition of Ugaritan urban and rural families. He concluded that, and I quote, the textual and archaeological evidence clearly demonstrates a preference for patrilocal residents reflected in the presence of three generation joint families in a substantial proportion of Ugaritian households. Schloon then uses the size of the dwellings as well as the available living space to suggest an average of 8.6 or 10.7 persons per house, depending whether each person had either eight or 10 square meters of living space. Some really sizable houses would have been inhabited by very large households of 43 to 60 persons, but these could have probably also comprised slaves and retainers. Also, some like Lefteris Platon have used serving vessels to reconstruct the size and makeup of the residential social group. This method, using the size of dwellings, is also the one used by Todd Whitelaw to re reconstruct the average Manoan house size of about 70 square meters at Gunia or the nuclear family. But it also has been at the basis of my alternative hypothesis, well, additional hypothesis, I would say, rather, to suggest the presence, besides nuclear households, of intermediate and even very large social and symbolic units, corresponding to what have been called houses in anthropological literature and house societies or house-based house societies. Such houses with a capital H can be compared to what have been called memory palaces in non-industrial societies or history houses at Chatal Huyuk, buildings which accumulated more transcendent knowledge and symbolic capital than others, since this aspect is also blatant where the Manoan houses are concerned. Hence, the house stands not only for the physical structure that is built, rebuilt, modified through time, but also as the container of a social group, a household of which the actual members live in or are affiliated with it at a particular moment in time, but also as the embodiment of a temporary, more extended intergenerational linkage, an accumulation of past events and ends of a group who uses the physical structure as a mnemonic device, a transcendent category. History is made through intergenerational use palimpsestic rebuilding, and locus boundedness, but it also brings along features of transmission, heritage, and property, which are lineage-related practices. Ancestral practices, too, may have been connected to this focal unit, which would explain the occasional discovery of skeletal parts in my own houses. And, as I've tried to show for Palekas, at least, the main unit of a block may have acted as the ritual focus for the entire group, where commensality and religious practices that served group integration took place. 
So houses, spaces, and architectures are ways through which identities and social relations are enacted and performed. They produce and support practices that themselves are needed to reproduce or generate identities and social relations. And if we limit ourselves to the larger residential complexes of Manoan Crete, the specific question which I want to explore again in this paper is whether there are ways to approach the spatial organization or the architectural configuration, if you wish, more socially, and to see what structure these, in other words, what the evidence is for in-house relationships for peopling the past. So the macro, the micro scale or proximate interactions of which Quentin talked this morning. So I'm actually concentrating first on late known three. Between 2007 and 2011, the Belgian school at Athens excavated the site of Kefali at Sisi, a settlement which was in use at least between early known 2A and late Menon 3b. Sisi is only four kilometers east of Malian. Both sites were occupied during the 13th century BC and preserve good archaeological and architectural context to allow a comparison, which is which I want to start with. Leaving aside the Annex E, excavated by Mol de Volder, on the south side of the court, so I'll leave aside this part, <coughs> which, a court which may have served the wider community, the main building, CD, on top of the hill at CC, which is this part here, excavated by Florence Guignoreau and Quentin Letisson, seems to be a single unified building in which, taking into account the plan, the graphs, and the quantitative values, three sectors can be distinguished. And I thank Quentin for these different architectural spatial analysis. The north wing, in orange, with the main hall, 3-1, and its annexes 4, 7, 4, 8, 4, 9, 4, 10, and 4, 14. So that's basically that area. Mm -hmm. As well as the entrance porch formed by 4, 4, which is this one. A south wing in blue, mm -hmm. centered on pillar hall 4, 11, with its different annexes to it. Mm -hmm. and, an entrance for, and an entrance porch formed by a possible uh, room in for space at least 4, 18. And a wing in green without central space and with a more functional nature, which also provides a spatial link between the two other wings. Both the north and the south wing are organized around what Quentin has called a pole of convergence, formed by a hull with double internal support, the function of which was at the very least to provide space for the gathering of people. So, both this hull and this hull. The rest of the north and south wing are architecturally and syntactically very similar and may also have been functionally similar. The accessibility for both areas is more or less identical, which also means that they provide equal access to the rest of the building. At the same time, it is clear that no efforts were made to provide easy communication between the two wings. See if you want to sort of go around it, actually. So the contact had to pass through the southwest or the green wing. Hence, differentiation, segmentation, and partitioning are evident together with an apparent replication of a coherent set consisting of a hall with various service rooms around it within the same building. This could, like if we try to explain it, suggest the presence of several families within the same complex, sort of a multi-family residence. But in the case of building C, there seems to be some evidence which rather than a replication, suggests some kind of functional complementarity. Indeed, despite the general resemblance between the two halls, there are some obvious differences. The column basis in 3.1 and the pillar basis in 4.11 are both actually placed, but whereas the entrance to 3.1 is also actual, the, that of 4.11 is not. In contrast, too, is the presence of a large hearth between the pillars in 411, this thing, but the absence of a hearth in 31. Further differences concern the finds made. Within hall 31 were found a deep bowl, a strainer, and a pithos, as well as a fixed installation against the east wall, perhaps evidence of what may have been a wine production, and two perforated stands of which the function is not clear. Put these in the middle there. There was also a collection of unused stone tools within a stone box here in the corner. In hall 4, uh, 11, we found the grinding stone, 
three cooking pots, a, stand, a transport stirrup jar, three small stirrup jars, a pixis, a goblet, a tubular stand, and an animal figurine. Moreover, the surrounding rooms of the two halls also comprise different assemblages. Immediately north of Hall 3-1 was a kitchen for eight with a small hearth, a deposit of edible shells, and a grinding installation, a potential bathroom 4.9, which was later reused as a pantry with cups and pouring vessels, and storage rooms around. In contrast, close to Hall 4-11 was a shrine, which is this area here, you see it over there, a room with grinding stones, 4.13, and one with storage vases, 3.3, and a room which comprised a large collection of spool-shaped loom weights, 3.6. This room over here. So this is just a preliminary list, since the full contexts are still under study, but it seems already evident that rather than replication, there seems to be complementarity. Before attempting an explanation, let us look at nearby Cartier Mu, Cartier Nu, sorry, Nu, but no, Mu, at Malian. Here, of the same period, was a large complex organized around a small court which carries the first pebble mosaic of the Mediterranean, sort of, uh, what you see over here, excavated for the French school at Athens by Alexander Farnoon and myself between 1988 and 1993. The entire quarter is about 25 by 30 meter large and extensively reuses earlier architectural features of the Middle and Early Late Bronze Age. But the fact that the structure was largely built as a single arrangement suggests at least some kind of kinship connection between the occupants. Still, there are several entrances that give access to different spaces, and a general organization in four wings could suggest the presence of different discrete co-residing replicated units. The pebble mosaic court, on which there were found some extraordinary objects, including a very large house metal, may however, have been shared by all the inhabitants. Again, an earlier space syntax analysis by Quentin Le Tisson clearly illustrates the potential existence of four sectors relatively independent from each other. But if we concentrate on the east wing, because there's some problems with chronology and the possibility that they are uh, destroyed at different moments in time, if we concentrate on the east wing, we also noted that here, too, there are larger spaces with internal supports f which form the main rooms, poles of convergence, places for proximate social interaction. Within each sector, so you see well, X11 here and X21, 22. But like we saw in building CD, so there is one hall in the north part, X11, which is actually accessible and has a central column, but no hearth, and one hall, X21-22, which is not actually accessible, but which has the central hearth. Again, elsewhere, we've presented detailed GIS analysis of the spatial distribution of objects in Cartier-Nu. What these distributions clearly underlined is there was no straightforward repetition of archaeological material within the different assumed architectural units. Hence, the different analysis lead to contrasting results. A general architectural examination combined with syntactic and visual analysis suggested that the existence of distinctive units without, however, clearly excluding the possibility of some complementarity between the units, as suggested by analysis of spatial configuration and the distribution of objects. Here it may also Suffice to note that loom weights and cooking pots, as well as cult implements, were primarily or exclusively located in the wing near Hall X21, X2, so especially in this part of the building. Whereas Hall X11 yielded an impressive stone vessel, this one fortunately broken, and in front of the main hall, in front of X11, was found um, a separate kitchen, which you see here, this building over there. Grinding stones, however, were found on both wings. Still, building CD at Sisi and Cartier Nu at Malia hence behave quite similarly. This also means that the, that the available archaeological evidence does neither correspond with that of a single extended household or that of independent domestic units. 
So an intermediate solution then is that both complexes were composed of more or less distinct units that entertained close spatial and other relations that were strong enough to find an architectural translation within a single residential complex next to around the court, which may, of course, have been the real interaction zone and convergence pole. The question remains, however, as to the type of complementarity that existed between the units. Could it be that, as in later Greece, one of the halls was the private hall where the entire family converged, whereas the other was the more public one where males entertained visitors and friends? Both Sisi and uh, Cartier-Nu have a high permeability with integration values which imply that all the constitutive spaces were potentially easily accessible from the exterior. Hence, this seems not the case. I don't think that the Greek, classical Greek interpretation works for this. Moreover, I've mentioned already that the circulation pattern does not allow such, such a suggestion either, since both at Sisi and Malia, the twin halls seem similarly accessible from the outside, which may imply that both halls may also, to some degree, have served non-residents, perhaps even on a permanent basis, basis which, which would, would then imply that the social group was larger than the potential residing group. So if we follow the eight to 10 uh, square meters per person, which both Schloon and Whitelaw have proposed, building CD at Sisi with its minimal size of 20 by 37.5 meters or 750 square meters, could have housed between 75 and 94 people and the east wing in Cartier Nu, measuring 15 by 20 meters or 300 square meters, could have housed between 30 and 37 people. These numbers seem perhaps too outsized, but the large hall 31 at Sisi oh no, that's not, uh, could easily have seated 40 people, half of the residents of building CD, or including people from outside. Before offering a hypothesis that may take into account these observations, the potential occurrence of the twin hall system elsewhere on the island during the late Mananon III period may briefly be considered. As at Khanya, for instance, in building one and two, although it's not entirely clear which room you could have, but there's a, you can have your pick. So, or perhaps even Palekastro, if uh, there's more over there. The clearest example occurs, however, during the following period, late Mananon III-C, at Vasiliki Kefala, which you see in aerial and here in plan. At this light, last site especially, one actually accessible hall, number six, has a central hall between two column bases and is connected to the cult area over here, whereas the other hall, two, isn't. A doorway which originally led north was blocked at some stage, whereas a door leads west into a storage room with pithoi cooking pots and cups. This replicated hall system, which I recognize in these three sites at least, does not, however, exist in all late Mennon three sites, since at Plati, Gunia, and Ayatriada, for instance, we encounter a kind of megaroid form, whereas in other sites only small and distinctive rooms are found. Hence the variety encountered must perhaps also imply that other in-house relationships existed than the one we try to identify at Sisi and Malia during late Mennon three. Now, the late Susan Kent suggested that increased partitioning of space should primarily be explained by an increased social complexity, resulting from gender or age distinctions, or from an increased social stratification or other types of specialization. Following this line of thought, and taking into account some of the finds, especially cooking pots and cooking places and loom weights, we may perhaps hypothesize that the gender distinction lies at the basis of the spatial differentiation. Cooking and weaving are two practices that are usually classed as maintenance activities, the daily tasks related to the sustenance, well-being, and effective reproduction of all the members of the social group. As such, these comprise caregiving, feeding, and food processing, weaving and cloth manufacture, hygiene, public health and healing, socialization of the children, and the fitting out and organization of related spaces. The material and symbolic structuring functions of these practices are essential for each society, and it is accepted that in most traditional societies, these tasks are performed by women. Indeed, a survey of tasks in 185 traditional societies using ethno-archaeological sources shows a biased gender-relatedness of some activities, especially the last section, 
loom weaving, oh, which is over here, spinning, cooking, and preparation of vegetal foods are especially connected to women and have relatively good archaeological correlates. The slide also shows, however, that in some societies, some of these tasks are also performed by men and that we should not really a priori assume binary and exclusive models of gender roles and identities. Hence, the list can only be used discreetly and with utmost care. But if you're not careful, like I will going to be, the list can only uh, sort of, but if we pursue this hypothesis and assume a gender orientation for these tasks and notice their spatial concentration, the possibility exists that the respective halls at CC and Malia were specifically used by one gender. The axiality, size, and monumentality of Hall 3.1 at Sisi, together with the possibility that wine was produced and consumed, may imply that it was the men's hall. This is my sexist approach. <laughs> the presence of a hearth, three tripod cooking pots, and grinders in Hall 4.11 at Sisi suggests maybe that we're de largely dealing with maintenance activities, and especially cooking and food processing activities usually associated with women. This then could imply that Hall 411 was the women's hall. Interestingly, it is this hall which is closely connected to the shrine 38 and the loom or looms standing in 36. The same reasoning <coughs> would result for Cartier New in seeing Hall X2122 as the women's hall with hearth, cooking pots, and an association with cult. So the room closes over there and Hall X11 as the men's hall where a fine stone goblet was found. This potential gender differentiation would also imply a functional differentiation between the different wings and the presence of a specifically male-oriented and specifically female-oriented spaces within both building CD and Cartier Nu, maybe even at Fazi de Key. Before we consider its wider implication, let us briefly consider other evidence, since late known three is, of course, the period for which we have independent textual evidence represented by the Knossian Linear B tablets, as well as funerary data. Now, the Mycenaean Linear B administration operating in and from the late known three or late 14th century BC palace at Knossos is only concerned with things that, are in, that interest this system and hence, we should not expect the tablets to give us a complete vision of contemporary society. Moreover, it not only gives a Knossocentric, but also a potentially Mycenaean as opposed to Minoan point of view, which is, of course, also opening possibilities for research. Now, in her recently published study, Women in Mycenaean Greece, Barbara Olson presents a thorough analysis of those women that do interest the bureaucrats of Pylos and Knossos, about 2,000 at the latter site. She's categorical. The tablets reflect a patriarchal, gender-segregated society in which the inferior status of women is evident. She states, and I quote, labor is gender-segregated not only by clustering women and men into single-sex work groups, but also by tasks and titles. In fact, of the about 200 titles or occupational designations uh, that are um, carried by the Knossian people, only five are carried by both sexes. All the others are gender specific. And these five are priests or priestesses, female slaves or uh, male slaves, slaves of the gods, so you have three, one, three one, different ones, and stitchers and weavers. But then, even though there are inequalities, with the male weaver being responsible for a workshop and the female weaver actually doing the job. Of these five, only the stitches and weavers are our immediate concerns, since they also form part of maintenance activities. The linear B tablets of Knossos add some other relevant information. Hence, women are often mentioned together with their children, but for the rest, only in textile-related context. And this involves more than a thousand women, whereas at Pylos, they are also involved in food processing and preparation, maintenance, and attendant duties, textile, and service. Moreover, the Knossos administration introduces age groups as an additional way to distinguish between women with adult women, girls, older girls, young women under instruction, and older women. Oh, sort of, um, we, we don't have that at Pilus either. But the inferior status of women and the gender segregation that are evident from the Knossos tablets do not find straightforward parallels in the funerary and iconographic record. Granted, 
where the funerary and the iconographic record is concerned, we may only preserve a bias sample, as we only preserve a bias sample, of course, in the linear B tablets of Knossos, of high class or low class individuals that had the right to formal burial in the case of funerals or priestesses in the case of iconography. But if you check the, the, the burials, it appears that both men and women receive ballast attention. And some examples, such as the princely burial of a woman, of a woman in the Arcanus Tholos A, which I've shown you here, the offerings associated with at least some of the women in the chamber tombs of Armeni, Moklos, and Knossos, and even the possibility that the person buried in the Ayatriada sarcophagus was a woman, should warn us taking the uh, textual evidence simply at face value. But if we return to the settlement evidence, it is clear that the hypothesis on the gender-specific nature of the wings at Sisi and Malia has several implications. First of all, if we accept loom weights, grinding tools, and cooking pots as archaeological correlates of specifically female activities, a gender-specific labor division seems to be suggested. It would probably be a mistake to assume a too rigid segmentation, but this would, to some extent, of course, confirm the information on labor segregation between the sexes given by the Knossos Linear B tablets. And if the gender hypothesis is indeed at the basis of the spatial organization of building CD and Cartier Nu, we are forced also to accept a binary and almost exclusive sexual division. And this because the whole systems at Sissi and Malia, but perhaps also elsewhere, only communicate in a very roundabout way. This seems to imply deliberate attempts at separation between the sexes, at least in these larger residential complexes. Although the elaboration and monumentality of those halls which we have associated with men are clearly more impressive than those of women, status differences, however, are not as boldly advertised as we would expect from the blatant power asymmetry suggested by the Knossos tablets. Rather, a complementarity, even if slightly unbalanced, between the sexes seems to be the case. Whether this is the result, and probably is, of my erroneous reading of the textual an archaeological context, or of the fact that the reality was indeed different than that represented by the Knossos administration, needs more consideration, however. But the almost immediate access to the presumed women's halls at Sisi and Malia does not suggest attempts to hide women in the more private sectors of the house, as being suggested for some later Greek houses. The patterns observed further suggest that women may have cooked in the area where they socialized, although this is a bit of a circular reasoning, of course, whereas men were brought the food from an outside or dependent area. Room 48 at Sisi, sort of, where it is, it? sort of how you can say. And the cooking shed uh, 14 at Malia, sort of over here. Probably continuing practices already evident in Laidman and Morn B, as I, will, as I will discuss in a minute. Moreover, at Sisi, a kitchen 415 down here, although located next to what I have identified as the women's sector, is linked to the outside court, reflecting a third type of commensality and one which may have had a more public character. Commensality being at the heart of social relations in all non-industrial societies, this seems to imply both gender-specific commensality practices were held, as well as gender-inclusive, more public events and that the gender exclusive meals, as seems, the case, seems to be the case in archaic Greece, were also a later invention. Again, this seems to suggest to me some kind of complementarity rather than an inferiority. Cooking and eating seem then to have taken place in different contexts and at various levels and different scales, from the most private to the, most, to the more public. And many in non-industrial societies, as for instance here upstairs is the matrifocal minangkabau in Indonesia, can be used as a parallel. Those who prepare the meals and those who participate are often subjected to, a strict, to strict hierarchy and rules. By merging the cooking with the dining area and living room, an informal mingling of functions and house members was achieved which may have placed women in a controlling position at the hearth of social activity and hence at the focus of the house's geography. And this was, incidentally, what Frank Lloyd Wright also did with many of his houses, as I said before. In fact, Alice Friedberg, in Women at the Making and the Making of the Modern House, 
explore to what extent Western bourgeois women clients influenced the design of a house they commissioned. It found that multiple function, functions replaced single function rooms and spatial divisions were much less present. Sliding doors that allowed rooms to be enlarged were common. Moreover, boundaries which much more, were much more permeable and a greater stress is put on the education and activities of children through an element of control, whereas private rooms were much less present or could be created for occasions. For the specialists of Minoan architecture here present, this may sound quite familiar. There are two other features which need to be stressed, the hearth and the shrine. If the, if the gender hypothesis stands a chance of being correct, both have an intimate connection to the women's wing. Men's wings have no immediate connection with cult, nor do they have hearts, and especially this last observation, which may be a bit difficult to swallow in view of the importance of central hearts and Mycenaean mainland palaces, where they are assumed to have a specifically male association. Performing, and here I quote uh, Quentin's recent paper on hearts in my own neopalatial architecture, performing a key role in social reproduction, central hearts may have played also the decisive function in terms of spatial solidarity, the locus where kinship is created through cooking and eating practices. So this, in my case, seems to underline the role of women in these practices, at least in late Manon III. And since the number of neopalatial fixed hearts known is quite small, as opposed to their common appearance in protopalatial Malia, for example, I feel less confident giving them so much importance already in the neopalatial period, especially since portable hearts, even if perhaps specifically or exclusively used in rooms with central pillars, gave a flexibility to internal arrangements. It may then be no surprise that near the male hall at Sisi, we found a portable heart. Finally, and perhaps more, most interestingly, is that the shrines in the complexes of Sisi, Malia, and Vasiliki Kefala are all closely associated, associated with what I've called the women's quarters, to such an extent that we may perhaps add them as an in-house maintenance activity. This is a rather intriguing suggestion, which needs more research, especially since most evidence for earlier domestic cult comes from the upper floors of the houses, where one would also have looked or hidden uh, the apartments occupied by women. The question then is, do this twin hall system and a potential in-house gender segregation represent a new feature from LM1B onwards, or is it a continuation of something which already existed before in Minoan residential architecture? The Minoan habit, since late preparation times, of constructing upwards rather than sidewards, and hence placing a variety of functions on the upper floor, prevents us from fully appreciating my own households from a comparative point of view. But already in LM1B, however, the situation may have been changing with houses which did not carry an upper floor gradually becoming the norm. The best example, and it's been mentioned already, is probably house B in the artisan's quarter at Mochlos, a sizable final, i.e. very late LM1B construction, which has a complex plan, including two larger rooms with a central pillar two and ten. These two are quite similar in axis and disposition, but not identical in visual permeability and integration, since hall ten is much easier with access and less segregated. It is this building, however, which was at the basis of the outdoor kitchen hypothesis, which Broken and Barnard have identified Alamon B. Mochlos, in which announces actually a post-palatial habit. Hence the replicated hall system, together with the external kitchens, may suggest that differentiated gender-related practices were already introduced before the final LM1B destructions. Other examples may be found at Malia and Sisi. The house at Aya Varvara, which you see at the top, is likewise dated to LM1B, and Pelon has suggested that rooms two to four originally formed a single room with wooden floors supported by smaller walls, something similar as, as Tim showed earlier on at Palekastra. Now, it are, these two, it are these rooms, two to four, which have all the loom weights and perhaps also an insulation for a loom. Hence, here two gender-specific rooms located next to each other may have existed. And at Sisi, there's a single, oops, oh, 
Oh, sorry, that's, that's all. And at Sissi, there's a single block formed by three neopalatial buildings, each with its separate entrance, but each perhaps also with more than one hall with a central column, cooking installations, and loom weights. And perhaps here, too, a gender division was already operational. The main question is, of course, to what extent or somewhat earlier polite neopalatial architectural evidence allows the recognition of a similar division. In comparison with late Manon III architecture, there's clearly a greater categorization and segregation in neopalatial residential buildings. And the existence of different and more elaborate interior designs suggests various ways of social structuring. But rather than symptomatic of a rigid categorization between the different residences or houses, which could be used indirectly to reconstruct some kind of class system along the lines suggested by John McEnroe in his 1982 paper, the elaboration seems to be primarily directed inwards and to hide, and to hide indeed the process towards greater differentiation between the in-house members. In other words, within each settlement, similarities in house, con in house size, construction, external appearance, elaboration, and decoration are unmistakable, giving the settlement a great homogeneity. This applies to more rustic settlements like Gunia and Psira, as well as to the more palatial ones at Knossos, Palekastra, or Malia. Somehow, this seems to adver advertise an ideology, and Tim talked about it also, which adhere to a message of broad and relative relative egalitarianism between the houses and ideology. But the increasing internal differentiation suggests greater distinction within the respective groups, maybe not between the different groups. The, un the unavoidable question then is whether this increased internal differentiation hides a potential gender differentiation or some other type of differentiation, like age or affiliation and so on. The suggestion is of course not new. And one of the founding fathers of my own architectural studies, Toronto's own James Walter Graham, had already followed up Evans's lead in the suggestion that, pal that my own palaces and large residences had both men's and women's halls. Now, in a paper for the volume edited by Diamantis Paniotopoulos and Utu Guntel Mashek, my own realities, approaches to images, architecture, and society in the Aegean Bronze Age, I have also explored this possibility, taking the lustral basin as a female initiation area, and hence related rooms, and especially Manon halls, as specifically used by women for gender-specific rituals, whereas areas identified as banqueting halls are always located in more easily accessible places of the houses or palaces, and never associated with lustral basins or Manon halls, and, perhaps, and hence perhaps more related to male practices. But whereas this potential gender division in Manon residences seems to be specifically related to semi-public rituals and practices, it cannot yet be shown to be operating in the more private sphere of more simple residences, where the central pillar room seems to be the pole of convergence for the entire family. The question is then, of course, whether the late Manon three system with a seemingly more advertised gender separation in all spheres, developed out of an earlier system where only semi-public, where only semi-public practices were conducted separately, or was it a Mycenaean in, uh, invention or uh, introduction? To conclude, following Max Weber, it's usually assumed that spatial segregation between the sexes implies unequal status and gender stratification. And anthropological studies seem to confirm that, taken comprehensively, the less spaces are integrated, as opposed to segregated along gender lines, the lower the status of women usually is. But quite a few studies, however, with segregated spatial arrangements do show relatively high status for women, including the Navajo, Nahayo, what you say? Navajo, uh, the Minangkabau, and the Atoni of Timor. Uh, and the written version of this paper will go uh, into this. Uh. Women's status in these societies is often a result of their control of labor, control of property, and degree of participation in public life. Much of this is, of course, cultural, but in these societies, the complementarity of the sexes and their duality, rather than the domination of one by the other, is seen as essential. The archaeological evidence of some late Manon III residences suggests, in my reading, a spatially segregated 
but complementary gender system in which the tasks, dealings, and cult practices of men and women were seemingly relatively balanced. Men and women seem to have, to some extent, have led separate lives and activities, both socially appreciated and matching. And perhaps this allows us to reinterpret some of the findings of the linear B tablets of Knossos. But we also, in fact, observed major differences between Pylos and Knossos, stating that Minoan la women labored in corvée workgroups, maintained property in their own names, and most importantly, owned land. So all a situation which he regards as a holdover from the Neopalatial period, and much better than the fate shared by their My Mycenaean mainland sisters. If twin halls and some kind of gender segregation complementarity are characteristic only for larger residences, both during Neopalatian and post-palatial times, the real houses with which this paper started, then we may finish with the observation that in smaller residences, men and women did not seem to have led segregated lives, and that the scale of the houses and the elaboration may after all reflect something more important than I initially assumed. If some small and internally simple houses should indeed be interpreted as residences for nuclear families, the others, by implication, are not. And this may then suggest different social dynamics and systems coexisting within the various settlements. It also warns us not to generalize conclusions and to take into account the possible existence of different temporal and ge geographical trajectories. Thank you.